Okay, I'll start the recording. Yeah, so welcome, Anita. Nice of you to uh, be our guest in our Bitcoin course. Welcome at and university. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Yeah, um, weather is fine still. I'm in Vienna. It's uh, one of the last warm uh, autumn days. Okay, C cannot say the same here. <laughs> the, the weather is nice uh, in the western part of uh, Norway, where I'm sitting right now, and I'm looking out, very beautiful scenery, but a bit cold. Yeah. Okay. You're in the north. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Anita, first, tell us a bit about yourself uh, for an introduction, please. Yes, um... I'm basically coming from e-commerce and web design. So I started as early as in 1999 uh, with uh, building websites and uh, was uh, doing it self-employed very early on uh, because I always wanted to be independent. And um, so I'm coming from that background. I had a small agency um, and we did um, e-commerce projects. We had uh, one of the first uh, online platforms where you could um, search and find co-working spaces at a time where there was only one co-working space in Vienna. So I'm always a little bit ahead of time, I think. And in uh, 2015, I was working uh, for bigger companies um, because, you know, sometimes uh, self-employment doesn't work out. And um, so I was doing big e-commerce projects there. And then I really thought to myself, so, okay, you're back. I mean, your career, you're in the middle of maybe coming to the end of your career in a way. What do you want to do next? Because I thought um, selling uh, stuff over the internet is not re doesn't really make sense in the Western world where we have so many things that we buy and we don't really need. And actually, I it wasn't interesting to me anymore. And I wanted to find something what, what's really mine. You know, I was always searching for that one thing where I'm so interested in it that I want to, to build my life around it in a way. And in uh, 2016, I decided to do a break. And um, in 2017, then I found Bitcoin because I went to a talk of a you, then university professor, um, it was Sherman Foschenkir, and she was talking about Bitcoin and open blockchains and what they can do for the world from the humanitarian standpoint. And um, I was blown away and I knew that's what I want to do now. And uh, so I started um, a, a solo business back then. And um, yeah, from then that time on, like from 2017, 2018 on, I, uh, I was able then to shift full time to do only Bitcoin education. So that's where I come from. So now it's a full time job for you. It's more than a full-time job. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to uh, to learn that uh, you first heard about Bitcoin from a university professor. That was uh, I wouldn't uh, assume that that's, that's not the usual. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly way of, of learning Bitcoin because my experience. I've been in. I'm a researcher uh, and I'm also teaching, and um, I've been in the uh, academic uh, institutions for. 25 years now. And my impression is that uh, uh, the universities uh, sadly are lagging in this uh, topic. And especially, well, they are interested in blockchain technology. Of course, mm -hmm. But when you mention Bitcoin, yeah, the, all, all kinds of uh, arguments come forward. Yeah, that's the same here in a way, because now they are calling it the blockchain center, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so, and I understand in a way because they are paid by the industry. Bitcoin doesn't pay them, you know. Bitcoin is not a company. And um, so I understand that from that point of view. But it's sad in, on, on the other hand, because as I feel sometimes education goes that way to say Bitcoin is old technology, you know, mm. uh, which is in my point of view completely wrong. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, that's... That's, that's where I came. I mean, I heard first from it in 2011, uh, which is really? interesting because I found my first tweet about it was in 2011. And but then I thought it's just another PayPal. I mean, I just didn't get it and I didn't research it more. Um, so like it, most, I think when I first encountered Bitcoin, that was my first impression as well. And that was in 2011. But 
I didn't uh, I didn't forget it. I I started looking more uh, closely into the first of all the te technology. I wasn't that interested in economy at that time. So my background has been technology. So I I wondered how can this work, and uh, then gradually. I this I, I found my way down the rabbit hole and yeah has has been there since I have to say yeah yes that's the story of so many people in the space because I as I said I'm coming from web design I was an urban planner actually I studied urban planning um, and uh, I also made my way through this rabbit hole of learning about economics uh, Austrian economics what is money you know the history of money I never knew where money comes from. Um, and once you understand how money is basically coming into the world at the moment, um, the fiat money in our nation states, then you understand that this is not, that can't be a sustainable uh, system. Um, in my point of view, it's the reason why we are in this crisis, in this climate crisis. Yeah, there can't be exponential growth all the time. I mean, we we can't grow that way in a way. Yeah, That's and and and. Yeah, very interesting because we we just uh, went through what uh, in our in our course we just went through uh, different economic schools schools of economy and of course we have two opposite uh, schools we have the dominant uh, Keynesian school the tradition from ma mainly uh, Keynes which is the economy of today and we have uh, the austrian school on the quite the opposite uh, end of the scale and uh, you being an austrian uh, I, I would maybe and also into bitcoin i would yeah i'm interesting to uh, to hear what what are your thoughts on uh, these different schools is are you are you completely uh, convinced that the austrian uh, way of thinking, I mean, the economy way of thinking is uh, the perfect one? I can't say that because I'm not so much into economy, you know, I'm not a theorist or a scientist in economics. But from what I learned in all those years from reading many books and writing my own book um, is that there are big differences, as I said before, be be between those two and the main school that has been taught on all universities is Keynes. And I don't know why nobody is teaching Austrian economics because I read some books about it. I made interviews with uh, uh, Rahim Taghi Sagedan. He's an Viennese Austrian economist. Mm -hmm. And he's, these two interviews are really very good if you want to understand a part of Austrian economics. And if you read that, it sounds so logical, yeah? I mean, the explanation what money is and what inflation is, it's so, yeah, I mean, inflation is basically when you have money as a good and you have more of it, then the value of it goes down. And that's what happening, what's happening when you are printing trillions of dollars, for instance, the value of the US dollar goes down. It's like the price for money, you mm. know? And so, yeah. Yeah, I completely buy the argument of uh, today's um, economy. It's credit driven. That's one thing, and it's uh, it's based on a, an almost an exponential growth. At least it's based on continuous exactly. growth. Mm -hmm. And seen uh, against the climate uh, threat, uh, we have to th start to think otherwise. I think, and and in that perspective, I think. Um, Bitcoin and also probably the Austrian way of thinking is is interesting. I don't completely buy into the gold standard and these things, but I'm 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 reading and learning, so uh, I, I absolutely buy the growth and yeah, perhaps I, the de degrowth perspective. Exactly. I mean, I also don't know if it if this is the the correct or right way for us. Yeah, but at least it's an alternative that uh, shows uh, alternative solutions and way how it could work, uh, ways how it could work. And uh, I believe we should also think of those alternatives and not only say the Keynesian way Keynesian way is the only one that we should go. And um, yeah, but but if you come up with those alternative ideas. Um, it's complicated because 
you can't just say two, three sentences about it. People won't understand you. So you always mm -hmm. have you always have to count on uh, people's uh, own interest to learn something new and to read a book. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult. So and that's difficult in ooh, today's world. I absolutely agree. Uh, we need a broader perspective in uh, the universities, and uh, we need. The students need to learn more about uh, alternative ways of seeing this. So absolutely, we have to talk about. Uh, but this is th these are perhaps Western countries' um, challenges. Maybe well, it's maybe the, a global challenge. But we have to talk about Africa because uh, that's the way I uh, I started to listen to your uh, podcast and um, the first episode was uh, you walking around in Zimbabwe and uh, talking to people. So you have to tell us a bit about uh, your journey to uh, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so the idea to go to Zimbabwe came up because I thought everybody's talking about hyperinflation and everybody in the Bitcoin space is talking about how Bitcoin is a solution to that. But nobody went to Zimbabwe, for instance. And I thought, okay, um, as a podcaster, you also need to have some sort of a USP. So, um, and I have a friend who's living in Zimbabwe. So um, I had, you know, a, a, a person there that could help me going forward because it's not that easy to travel in Zimbabwe. And um, so I thought, okay, let's do it. So I went there in early 2020. And uh, as you said, yeah, I was talking to people um, who already have been using Bitcoin at that time and had some experience with it because I wanted to understand um, what their problems really are. And as a European or a US American, uh, or even more as a European, I think you have a very well working uh, banking system. And that's one thing that you don't have in Africa. Uh, you basically can't send money from Zimbabwe to uh, a neighboring country easily. Yeah, um, you can't send money from Zimbabwe to Kenya, for instance, and things like that. You also have lots and lots of red tape um, and you need, it's very time consuming to do your banking. Um, the, 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 the Zimbabwe even more has currency controls. Um, so if you, for instance, have a business running in Zimbabwe and you want to import goods from another country, uh, you have to first ask the Central Bank of Zimbabwe if you're allowed to import these things to Zimbabwe. And until you get the, the okay or the no, uh, the time period that you have your contract might be over again. So, so the Central Bank and the government in Zimbabwe are really, in a way, ex I mean, it's a very corrupt country. Um, sadly. So the, the financial elite that there are, the political elite, starting with um, Robert Mugabe, the dictator, uh, really extracted everything from the people. And the people were with, um, in those hyperinflationary phases, um, the government invented basically new money and told them, okay, from this day on, your US dollar accounts in your bank accounts are converted one-to-one -to, -one to the new Zimbabwean dollar. But don't worry, uh, the value of the, the Zimbabwean dollar will stay, it will be, be the same. So of course, everybody knew that's not true. And I think, I don't know how much the value has fallen since then, but you can't compare it, you know, like, like they, they really rob people from their money. And so, the uncensorability of Bitcoin, the transportability, the easy way to access it. So I think the access is the most important part in a way to have access. You don't need an ID. You have to think about there are like billions of people living in authoritarian countries um, or billions of people who don't have an ID. So if you don't have an ID, you don't get a bank account in our system. So how do you want to save money? How do you want to start a business or, or have an account for your little farm, you know? Um, and Bitcoin enables all of that. And that was also the reason why I went to Zimbabwe and why I'm, I'm interested in Bitcoin in that sense, in the way how it can support the human, humanitarian cause. 
It's not so. so what did you yeah. What did you find out? What is it? Uh, is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency legal in Zimbabwe? What, what, there is, is no, the legal status. There is no. Uh, there is no status. Mm. So you basically don't know. Is it okay or is it not okay to do it? That's the reason why some of my 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 interview partners wanted to stay anonymous. And for me, it also it's always I always thought okay. I have been thinking. I hope I can back, go back to Zimbabwe <laughs> <laughs> after these podcasts. Um, but um, it's like that. So most people there trade in peer to peer groups. You know, like um, they have their own Telegram or WhatsApp or, or Facebook groups. Um, where you build trust, you know each other, and you get recommendations who is a trust, uh, trusted partner in a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So, because there have been a lot of scams too. That's the sad thing. All over Africa, people have been ripped off by scams because they also don't know. I mean, if you don't know what's the difference between Bitcoin and any shiny whatever, and there have been so many MLM schemes like one coin, for instance, and how they are all co called. I think there is still a one coin thing going on, even if we- Probably we, several. Yeah. yeah. So that's so sad to see. Um, but um, my, my recent um, um, information from Zimbabwe is that yes, of course, in the last year since I've been there, uh, the usage of Bitcoin has grown. Um, I know um, a friend of mine in Zimbabwe, um, she was able to not only um, receive Bitcoin as donations to open up the school she's the director of again, but also she's she's a digital entrepreneur on the side. So um, she started to pay her uh, friend in Kenya, her freelancer there in Bitcoin because it was the easiest way. And she told me even her parents who are living in a small, very small town in remote Zimbabwe, they have a wallet now and they save in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the thing is, you know, people don't have much money to save. So, um, it's important for Bitcoin, and uh, that's a good thing that we have now the Lightning Network, so that people there can use Bitcoin in small, small uh, values like uh, macro, uh, uh, micro payments, and uh, that's opening a complete other door. You know, like that Bitcoin is becoming a means of payment, like a payment. Uh, uh, Money, yeah. So yeah, to yeah. to use it in a, in 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 daily transactions, yeah. and we see that also that Paxful, for instance, which is a peer to peer exchange, they now have uh, Lightning uh, payments available, and so I think we can't imagine here how fast the growth in the usage is going in African countries. Yeah, it's uh, remarkable. And uh, you mentioned the Lightning Network and the development there has been astonishing. It's it's not more than, well, two or three years ago, it, it was kind of officially uh, launched and it has grown uh, like, well, enormously. And of course, it's very important for uh, not at least African countries. I talked to a Norwegian guy yesterday he lived in uh, Zimbabwe for one year in uh, 2014, I think, uh, mm -hmm. just to uh, get some information before talking to you. I have to kind of educate myself. Uh, uh, what about Zimbabwe? And he, uh, he didn't know about Bitcoin then, but he, um, one thing he noticed was what you were also saying, the long, long lines uh, in front of banks, uh, people trying to... Uh, take out cash they didn't have any bank account they would probably not have any but uh, it was it was money transfer from abroad probably and they waited in queue forever to take out this money and uh, of course a lot of it went to uh, the bank obviously easy to be robbed and you have all those kind of things Exactly. And sometimes it's uh, the way that you stand in line for hours and at, le at the time when you are at the uh, ATM, the ATM is empty because it's really difficult to get hold of cash, uh, be it Zimbabwean dollars or be it US dollars. And people, all the people want US dollars because they know that uh, it keeps its, its value compared to their own currency. And um, most people there actually use easy cash, which is... Um, 
mobile money. Um, I guess you've heard from, uh, oh, no, what's the word for it now? The name. Um, there's another mobile money operator, a big one that people know here in Europe, but I forgot the name is it now. The, is it not the M-Pesa? M M Pesa, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And you so, also have BitPesa, the kind of. Uh, yeah, that's also uh, confusing. <laughs> yeah. But M Pesa was the yeah. first, and then Easy Cash is basically the same. So people uh, only need a, a an old Nokia phone, for instance, yeah, where you only can send SMS, text messages, and that's the way how they pay things. So like small um, um, purchases are bought uh, through Easy Cash. And but Easy Cash, the problem is uh, it's a centralized company, and the the, the government um, tells them what they are allowed to do or not. So they are cracking down sometimes on account holders and things like that. And you don't have that control in Bitcoin, of course. Yeah. So so the need for Bitcoin is much higher in developing countries and people understand it immediately if you tell them that it's uncensorable and there's only 21 million of it they immediately know what it's about yeah hmm. so yeah yeah i see i have a comment and question in the chat and the quest well the comment is that uh, one coin is still uh, having large seminars in Afri africa and latin yeah. america it's so sad as you see. yeah there's a question uh, is it mostly bitcoin that's growing in um, uh, in africa or is it also other cryptocurrencies and i will just add um, your podcast is bitcoin only so you might say something about your own uh, mm -hmm. yeah so to be honest, I can't tell you the numbers of other currencies because I'm Bitcoin only. Mm. So, but what I know is from my uh, talks back there that people love to trade. So um, everybody, or most of the people, I think, are trying to, to earn some profit or, or gain profit through trading cryptocurrencies. Yeah. So of course they use other cryptocurrencies as well, as far as no, I know, um, but um, still, Bitcoin is the biggest and it's the, 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 the most um, valuable one because of the 21 million, because of the scarcity and the security. And that's basically also why I'm doing a Bitcoin only podcast. Yeah? When I started in 2017, 2018, with, in 2018 with the podcast, um, at the beginning, I also was uh, not knowing where to look out or, or, or what's the difference between all those cryptocurrencies. Yeah. So, but the more I studied it, the more I, I realized that Bitcoin is the only one of those uh, that has the properties that are needed to be able to be used in an extreme case, yeah? For instance, if you're a human rights worker, uh, you need lots of privacy. Of course, you could also use Monero, for instance, but Monero doesn't have this 21 million limit and stuff. So, um, so in my view, Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency where you don't have a leader, you don't have a company, you can't take down uh, the code in a way. It's the most decentralized cryptocurrency Everybody can run a full node. You only need um, a, a, an old laptop or something like that and or a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and you, be a, you can be a part of consensus, basically. And you yeah. can't do that with the others. And that's why I think it's the, the best tool for the humanitarian cause. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. It's unique in so many ways. And uh, I, I think also it's impossible to copy in uh, those... Uh those properties and the history and one thing uh, many tends to forget many tend to forget is liquidity um, there's a huge difference in liquidity i mean bitcoin is on another scale so that's also important when you're going to use bitcoin mm -hmm. for trading or even store value so exactly and i think that was one of the problems early on in zimbabwe for instance because if you ha don't have liquidity and uh you can't exchange it uh and people might not have us dollars but what i can tell you now i know that it's very easy at the moment or now in zimbabwe if somebody is sending bitcoin for instance as a donation or something like that to to a zimbabwean uh to meet up with a person who will give you us dollars 
in a moment, you know, for exactly the amount without uh, um, like um, wanting to have some kind of fee for it. Yeah, I have a friend who's he, who, who did it like two weeks ago, and she said it was completely easy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, liquidity is there now. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you're right. That's that's an important fact. Yeah, and another important thing is of course education and you also touch upon that um, you are educating people i am trying to educate people but this is one of the really really important tasks so uh, what, what can you say about about it both from your perspective and also maybe from in in austria and other other, other countries yeah, you're right. Um, in, if we talk about the scams, we see how important it is to be educated. But some, sometimes even if you're educated, you fall for a scam because they're really good sometimes. So um, I think a lot has changed. When I came into the space in 2017, you could find a lot of information already uh, freely on the internet about Bitcoin. Uh, but most people, yeah, they didn't know the name, but they didn't know more about it. Today, people are... Uh, have much more information already. Uh, they might even uh, hold Bitcoin in one or the other way uh, and then come and ask you uh, how it's built, what it's, what, what, what's the thing you know, behind it and want to be educated more. Um, so um, that has changed and there's a lot of information out there, um, but I think one of the reasons, for instance, why I wrote my book, Learn Bitcoin with the L in brackets is because I never found something, or maybe I wanted to have a book like that in 2017, you know? Um, so, because all of this free information online, you don't know, can you trust that? I mean, and you would have to need, need to, um, like, you don't know the optimal way to learn things. You know, you as a teacher, you know that there are ways how it's easier to be educated or to, to, to understand things. And that's what I try to do in the book, like lead people from why do we need Bitcoin? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, how is uh, our money or, or, or our current money made? I mean, what, where does it come from? Why is Bitcoin interesting as an alternative to it and things like that. And then I'm going into the, and how can you uh, uh, earn Bitcoin? How can you buy Bitcoin uh, and security measures and these kinds of things? So yes, I think education is very important. And we also see it like in El Salvador, for instance, now where the government said it's even legal tender. Um, so people, have to use it. Um, at least businesses, I think, have to use this. Use it. Um, and I, as far as I heard, most people don't even know what Bitcoin really is, and that's also a reason why many people go out on the streets and and say we don't want Bitcoin because, yeah, what is it? Yeah. So I think education is really, really important, and because there are so many misunderstandings, you know. Absolutely. And, and even, uh, well, not at least uh, in the leading media, I, I guess it's the same in uh, your country as in uh, Norway. There's so much uh, uh, miseducation, uh, FUD, uh, these old stories uh, recirculating again and again. And um, it's, uh, yeah. So I think journalists should also be uh, educated uh, on this. Yes, that's actually also what I'm trying to do. If uh, journalists ask me for articles, I try to educate them. But sometimes the article is still not really representing what, what you want to say. Because, as I said, it's not easy to understand everything about Bitcoin. And I'm learning daily, you know. Um, me too. So, yeah, exactly. So just if you read, if you read free some people think if they have read free articles in a paper, then they know Bitcoin. Um, I tell you, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think you will ever understand it. Uh, the complete, uh, well, to grasp the complete, uh, well, possibilities and everything. I'm mm. as you. I'm I'm learning every day, and I find that uh, teaching Bitcoin is uh, valuable because I. Uh, 
I'm asked uh, questions and I have to, I, th I thought I knew this and then I have to uh, go and look up and I, I see that, yeah, maybe it wasn't like I thought, it was uh, something else. And yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, all this here. learning. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. So uh, your book is uh, aimed at, uh, that aimed at uh, beginners, I understand. So it's, it's low tech, it kind of, it's not, how technical is it? Uh, it's not too technical. So um, because I wanted that beginners can understand the technology too and why it's important. It's very practical. So I give a lot of uh, tips on security, how to store your coins uh, securely and things like that. Um, and um, sorry, now I lost the... Yeah, the but it's a book uh, you would <laughs> yeah, like it's to for... read when you started to learn about well, Bitcoin. It, Exactly. So you can be a complete uh, beginner, or maybe you even uh, have your first uh, coins or parts of coins. Um, then I think it's also an interesting read because it gives you a overview of all basically that's uh, important in Bitcoin. I'm also talking about the uh, energy need of Bitcoin, uh, about um, the petrol dollar, for instance, what's that and things like that. Mm. We have to uh, also talk about uh, the gender issue because uh, there are not very many uh, uh, women in this space. Uh, I can see it's growing. That's that's very good. And I uh, and one third of the students in my course is uh, are female actually. So it, it was surprising and. I'm very happy to see that, but um, the space uh, as a whole, it's dominated by uh, men and uh, young white men, <laughs> young white male. <laughs> what, are, what are you your observations? Uh, that's my observation too. Yeah, uh, but I think it's logical in a way. I mean, just look at the the education or how we bring up our children. What's the the image of women and men in media? Um, uh, that's that's only that's coming from or uh, how we educate our children, and we stay in these stereotypes. And if you think that. Um, Bitcoin is made of uh, several uh, scientific, say, uh, uh, branches. Yeah, like you have, on the one hand, you have IT, you have mathematics and cryptography, you have law, you have um, um, finance, and these all are um, spaces where men are dominating still. So it's only logical that in Bitcoin, that's combining everything that you have a lot of white men. And also new technologies very often um, come from countries where there's the possibility to, to uh, there's the, yeah, the possibility to develop new uh, technologies. So I think that's quite logical. And it reminds me of the time 1999 or something like that when I started with web design. These were also all men groups. And it changed with time. And I think really it's great that you have a lot of female students because uh, for me, Bitcoin uh, is feminist in a way. It's emancipation from uh, financial patriarchy. You know, So it gives people, women power. I mean, there's one interview I did with the Nigerian Feminist Coalition, which is really great. Yeah, I listened to that. And um, so it's really from first hand and um, that's why I think that this will also change and it's changing. Uh, I know two, three, four Bitcoin core developers, female uh, Bitcoin core developers, and you don't need to be a developer to work in this space. There are so many jobs right now. Um, startups, companies are growing. They are looking for people, uh, be it marketing or, or, or law or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, so, so there's room and um, I think it's important to have a diverse set of people uh, in this space because just as an anecdote, um, I met a young woman uh, earlier this year in Vienna, she did a documentation or a little interview with me about Bitcoin and I was speaking about the humanitarian case and inflation and things like that and afterwards she said to me, you know what, I never heard this. I only know my, my young white friends, uh, male friends, who are like investing and like gambling with the coins. And I'm feeling like, oh, I don't want to touch this, you know. 
but now she 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 understood that there's a complete different side to that and then in the end she said to me but actually wouldn't i support this thing uh, this humanitarian cause if i use bitcoin and i said exactly <laughs> yeah. i think um we see at least in uh, in norway and i guess uh, as in most uh, western countries we see a movement uh, where women especially younger women take more responsibility for their own economy and they uh, try to uh, learn more about the economy but also investment and uh, we see a clear trend and i guess the interest for bitcoin is uh, is kind of another side of this uh, this broader trend so we clearly see it mm -hmm. and that i guess that goes for more than norway it's uh, yeah, also in other I, countries i think norway is a little more feminist than austria maybe uh, i'm not sure about that uh, so there's more gender um 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 how to say equilibrium equality equality yeah, then here, um, because it's still here like 20 or 30 percent uh, difference in income here for women and men. And um, so um, for me, I tell all my friends, all, all, also my male friends, but more my female friends, please, if you have some money that you don't need for other things, and if you lose it, you're not crying about it, put it into Bitcoin, please do it. Yeah. And um, I mean, now it's easy to say because we have a new all-time high. So if the value goes up, you're always the star because you have told them to, to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, but um, you need to be, uh, sh yeah, you need to think about the fact that it will go down again. But you, you have to think long term. And that's also, for me, the thing that Bitcoin uh, brings is this long term thinking, long term saving. Don't buy stuff that you don't need buy some satoshis for it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely um i'm wondering uh, you know in the bitcoin um, community there's something uh, called bitcoin toxicity and some say that uh, the community is quite hostile to uh, could be to newcomers how what is your impression uh, being uh, not new, but uh, how how were you welcome to uh, to the space and to the community? You have to see that two things differently. You have to see the Twitter community, um, uh, crypto Bitcoin Twitter, uh, where you don't know people sometimes, um, and they are very harsh. That's true. Um, I tend to block or mute uh, people who don't have the awareness to talk to others in a respectful manner, uh, because I think it's not needed um, to, to be hostile to others, <clears throat> just because they don't understand maybe. I think it's uh, actually um, um, doing the opposite, you know? I mean, if you are toxic to someone, why should he or she then be interested in Bitcoin if the other person on the other side says you're an idiot, you know? And these things happen. Uh, and even stars from uh, like Nicholas Taleb, for instance, uh, you see how they are in a way behind their facade, you know? Um, and that's, yeah, eye-opening. And um, on the other hand, you have like regular events where you can meet people and talk to them. And the Bitcoin community in general is so much very open. Um, if you are genuinely interested in Bitcoin, um, then everybody will answer your questions. I mean, if he or she has the time to it, yeah, but um, it's a very open community. People help you out. I mean, you will see, for instance, if you look at my book, the, the recommendations I have from people like Lynn Alden, Andreas Antonopoulos, and people like that, they are very open. But of course, you need to earn that trust before. And, hmm. and for earning trust, that's also why I started the podcast, because I thought then I can talk the, to these people, then they know me. And I traveled a lot to these conferences in 2018 and 19. So it's important to build trust. But then, um, as I said, it's an open source community. People are very helpful. And um, just, um, yeah. You, you have to be generally interested and uh, just mute people or block people who are not nice. 
That's also my impression. Uh, on the whole, a very, very welcoming and warm uh, community. You yourself is an example of that. It's uh, yeah. I th I, f I feel it's easy to uh, get in contact with uh, people around the world, really, and uh, yeah. they are really helpful if they have the time. And uh, so it's really uh, good to see. Uh, I think we could probably go on for at least one hour, <laughs> but we have some uh, limits and we have uh, other things uh, on our schedule today. So. Uh, finally, um, where can people uh, get in touch with you and um, contact you and uh, learn more from you? Yes, um, the best way is on Twitter. My handle is Anita Posh, just my name, uh, or my website, anitaposh.com, where you find links to my podcast and to the book, uh, and also, I think, a contact form. <laughs> there should be one. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, get in contact. I try to answer everything I can. Um, and yes, let's thank you very much. Thank you so much for being our guest and uh, good luck with your important work. We look forward to uh, more episodes from, uh, from you and possibly uh, uh, revisit to uh, Zimbabwe and yes. Africa. That's actually what I plan for next year. Um, now in November, I'm going to El Salvador. Um, and yes, so there will be more. <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for yeah. the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.